Gasoline is proudly brought to you by Shannon's Insurance for Motoring Enthusiasts and the following sponsors. I'm Michael Curzon, producer creator of Gasoline. Hope you enjoy. week on gasoline we were given permission to check out a unique car collection it was in an old shed on rural property that almost resembled something like the Amazon jungle after some time we finally found it We couldn't believe what we found inside. Wow. That's more than just a car collection. Joint's full of muscle cars. Let's check them out. Unreal. This massive chook shed here is chock-a-block full of muscle cars. I know that might sound hard to believe, you've got your legendary GT Phase 3s and all the rest of it, but you reckon this was the most refined car to drive out of the whole lot. The 350 cubic inch small block Chevy and these HTs, the Muncie gearbox, the 12 bolt rear end, angry 351 Cleveland and a big camshaft, all the gear, they made awesome power and they were a bit of a pig of a thing to drive too, which added to the excitement. This HQ GDS 350 two-door Monaro, a great looking car. XAGT Falcon Coupes, they're a tough looking piece of machinery aren't they? Great looking rear end too, with heaps of room for great big fat rubber. That's why they look so fantastic on the racetrack in their day. But it wasn't until the LJ GDR XU1 that they really started to shine. The evolution of that car was absolutely sensational. They came into their own. The LJ featured a very hot little 202 inline six cylinder engine, larger triple carbs. In fact, the 73 Bathurst edition had tubular headers, a larger camshaft, improved oiling system, and a whole host of goodies that really stuck it right to those V8 boys. When Ford decided to get out of motorsport and decided that they didn't want to race the XD Falcon, they just chopped their whole motorsport program, Wayne Draper was a little bit upset. He had other ideas and secretly started penciling up this car. He worked with people like Murray Carter and others to help homologate the XD Falcon for Group C. The rest is history. We all know what Dick Johnson did. The car was absolutely lightning fast and won race after race, even winning Bathurst. Join us this episode as we check out more of this collection before we run out of daylight. Now I've got to say I'm a little bit partial to these HZ GDS Holdens. I reckon they're a great looking car for the day. Their front and rear spoilers, their colour-coded bumpers, they're a really good-looking piece of machinery. Another standout feature of the HZ was the RTS, Radial Tune Suspension. RTS wasn't just a fancy badge to impress people. Radial Tune Suspension had a whole world of work put into these things to make them handle properly. They changed the entire suspension geometry, upgraded sway bars, spring rates, did all sorts of wonders to make these things handle like they were on rails. It was a major transformation from the HQ Holden days. They were a little bit like a boat where these things were stiff and taut on the road. Very impressive. Another interesting piece of machinery beside me here is these LE Monaros here. Now when the day or in their time, the Monaro was basically over, it had finished, but GM had a whole heap of body shells at General Motors going nowhere. So they decided to make 
a current model Monaro, call it the LE in limited edition. That's why you just don't see too many of these things floating around on the roads today. A super rare car. Now this was really the entry level for Chrysler Australia into the performance scene. Not an all guns blazing car mind you, but the VF Valiant Pacer was still better than your average off the showroom floor Valiant. It had a slant six engine in it too. And a few other little treats like stripe work, instrumentation and what have we, just to make it stand out amongst the pack. These old slant six Valiants will pull a house down. Enormous amount of torque, go forever and a day, just a great engine. Don't forget viewers to look up the all new Shannon's Club. Shannon's Club is a huge site, it's like a hub for enthusiasts. You jump on there, you can start your own garage, put pictures of your cars up there, stories of your cars, videos, you name it. You'll see people like myself on there, Jim Richards, click on our garages and check out some of our machines and some of our past machines. It's an incredible site, it's growing every day, so get onto it and have a ball. The SLR 5000, especially the L34 version of this Tirana, was a very important turning point in Tirana history. The LJ XU1 had done its job and done its job well on racetracks, but it was time to move up to a V8 to take it up to the big boys once again. And they did an extremely good job. They did have a few weaknesses though on the racetrack. This particular early model of car being the L34, they only had a banjo rear end and an Aussie four-speed gearbox. Those things used to break like twigs. They had a hell of a time just trying to keep those things alive on the racetrack in the day. Even in today's historic motorsport, I still see people racing these things, blowing gearboxes apart and breaking diffs. So it's unfortunately an Achilles heel that these cars had. But while they were running, they were absolutely flying and an awesome car on the racetrack, giving it to those big fours that were out there in the day. But things changed when they went to the A9X model. The A9X addressed a lot of those issues they had with the L34. They fixed all those little teething problems and things that were breaking. They went to a T10 gearbox, which were very tough. A heavier duty Salisbury rear end and disc brakes also on the rear. They were so much better than the drum brakes, it wasn't funny. And they'd last their distance, especially in long distance races like Bathurst. So much so that legends like Peter Brock in 1979 won that race by six laps, demolished the opposition, and get this, on the last lap he actually broke the lap record. Those cars are the epitome of muscle in Australia. When it comes to muscle cars, I reckon it doesn't get much tougher than the ONX Tirana. He's even got a pair of XB GTs here too, this four-door sedan and this coupe here. Four-door's got the good old four-speed manual, this is an auto version. The XB was a little bit softer compared to your XA's. Pollution regulations started to come in, things were tamed down a little bit, performance wasn't quite as exciting. But have a good look at the XB GT and compare it, do yourself a favour, jump on the net, compare it to a 71 Ford Mustang. 
you'll see a lot of similarities, believe me. Have a look at the colour-coded bumpers, some of the stripe work, the scoops, different things here and there, and you'll see where a lot of inspiration came from for the XBGT. My mum used to drive a red one around when I was a young kid, used to pick me up from school. I thought I was the king of the world. It was a great looking car, and they still are even today. Now, while I'm on the topic of GT Falcons, I've got to say it's a fantastic era for restoring these cars. With people like GT Ford Performance and Injury Victoria out there to help us all. I've got to be honest, they have been long time supporters of gasoline. They've been really good to us. But on the other side of the coin, they are a fantastic operation. It's a credit to them. Go down and check out their showroom. It'll blow you away. Their website, it'll blow you away. There's so many components and part numbers available these days, and every part is spot on. Michael Kirsten, the producer, has got an XA Falcon he's restoring, and I've got, of course, the XYGTHO replica Project Warhorse. Every part I've acquired from them has bolted on to absolute perfection, just like the factory original part. I'm proud to be wearing GT Ford Performance parts on my car. And here's where it started for Chrysler in motorsport in Australia, or not far off it. Coming from the slant six powered Pacer, right through to this VG model range Pacer here, the 245 Hemi, the smaller than the later 265 Hemi, with a two barrel and four barrel carburetor option. Now on paper, the four barrel option should have made more power, but it's a known fact that the two barrel was a little bit faster car overall as a package. The four barrel was well known for very heavy flat spotting out of corners. There are a quick thing on the racetrack too. One of the Gagan brothers right behind the development of these cars it really helped the performance overall and the support he gave to the Chrysler engineers to build a beautiful package. These things also led Bathurst for a period at one stage during the race. So they certainly did make people notice for a six cylinder car. I think Chrysler wanted to take the approach of Holden at the time with the XU1 six cylinder powered Tiranas and see if they could give it to them. And they really did give them a bit of a fright there for a while. Our next stage with Glenn's 351 Cleveland is line boring the main tunnels. With the line boring of the main tunnels, this, this process, because we've fitted steel centre four bolt caps, they are semi-finished and also we need to line bore to ensure the true and correct roundness and parallelism of the main tunnels. With machining the main tunnels and sizing, this is imperative for surface finish roundness, size, bearing contact, and bearing clearances. The tooling we're using on this machine here is uh, critical for the surface finish that we want to achieve. With the machining of the main tunnel and the surface finish, this is so imperative that the bearing has a good and even surface finish to sit on. The back of the bearing relies heavily for heat transfer and bearing clearance with the crankshaft journals, oil clearance, we machine it to the lower limit of the tolerance and this is allows us to use different graded bearings to grade the bearings to achieve the correct bearing clearance. 
Uh, what we're doing here is we're setting the tool size. On a Cleveland, the tool size, the tunnel size is 2.9, 41 and 7 tenths. We've got a digital vernier here. We're setting the tool size to the size there. We've got, it's in thousandths of an inch there. So we come along and we can adjust the tool up and down to get our correct tunnel size. We've got a dial indicator over here to get fine adjustment. We can adjust the tooling within one tenth of a thou. We set our tool size to two thou under the nominated tunnel size. After that, we take a cut, then we set it to finish bore size using this dial indicator here, and we bore the whole five tunnels to finish bore size. Okay, with these blocks, if this operation's not carried out properly or if you have a misalignment or a tunnel that's out around, and especially with these older blocks, what the consequence of having a bearing misaligned is you'll have a contact where the, the crankshaft will actually contact the bearing and, and it won't allow an oil film. And with this, the bearing will heat up or it'll pull material away from the bearing and your result will be bearing failure. So this is to ensure that you've got a, a perfect oil film that and around your crankshaft, especially in a high performance application where this engine will see very heavy crankshaft duty. Our next process with this block is to grout fill the water jackets. And with this process you will note that we'll have the torque plates bolted on. These torque plates are to ensure that the distortion is to simulate the cylinder heads being bolted on. Well, here we are back at Rocket Industries once again, so let's go inside and take a look around. Now, if you're building a car, restoring it from the ground up, you're going to need a wiring solution. And to get someone to wire a car up for you in this day and age costs a small fortune. There's a bit of work involved, but there is a more affordable option from Rocket Industries when it comes to wiring your car. With options from companies like Easy or Painless. Some great kits available. You can get a plug-in kit that's suited to a particular vehicle covering many American vehicles and also Australian vehicles, even Holden Ford. Or you can get a universal kit like this easy kit here. Now not everyone is a wiring guru, so it might be your first time when it comes to wiring your car up. So they've simplified it, they've made it easy. Even down to the point where about every 100 mil or so throughout this wiring, it's actually marked. It's actually printed on the wire what it's actually used for. So for example here, ignition coil brake lights, left hand rear tail lamp assembly. These are the sort of things that make the job so much easier when you're running that loom right through the entire vehicle. Also, within their instructions here, they've got simple diagrams for common cars like GM, Ford and Chrysler, just to give you a little bit of a helping hand along the way. On top of that, to complement these wiring looms, you've got things like wiper switches, 
headlight switches, ignition key, lock and barrel. You've got things like brake light switches for hydraulic application. You've got a mechanical brake light switch available. There's so many products available to cover all your needs when it comes to wiring your car at a fraction of the cost. The thing I like about these easy kits here is the 125 GXL grade wiring. It's heavy duty, but it's also acid, oil, and fuel resistant. Also heat as well. It can cop a lot of punishment and last for the long term, and that's what you want. Now just to give you a little bit of an idea of how much you can save by going down this path, to have your average car wired up these days by, say, your local auto electrician can cost around about $2,000 upwards. Something like this easy wiring kit here in a 12 circuit option, the basic kit, costs $289. That is a huge saving. Sure, there's a bit of time involved in setting it all up yourself, but the saving is well worth it. That money can then be put into other areas in your build. And we all need all the help we can get, don't we? For your free copy of the Rocket Industries and Aeroflow Performance Products catalogues, go to the Gasoline website and click on the link. With over 650 combined pages of performance parts and accessories, you're sure to find everything you need for your car. You're watching Gasoline! Well, as you can see, it's starting to get a bit dark down this end of this shed. It's a huge shed, so long, it's like being in a massive cave. So we've got the spotties out, because I wanted to show you a very important topic, a topic that's very dear to my heart, the Valiant Charger. Look at what I found here. I can't believe this collection, an E38, the genuine article. For those of you that don't know what the E38 Charger was, it was Chrysler Australia's race version of their Charger. They weren't on the budget that GM and Ford were on, but they had brains, a lot of brains in their department, but the bean counters still held them back. Either way, they did a fantastic job. They didn't go with the V8, they went with their famous 265 Hemi in line six, and these engines were absolutely insane. Even in standard two-barrel configuration in your everyday Valiant, the things would beat most V8s. They were unbelievable. Talk to pull a house down. So imagine when they started hotting these things up with a modified camshaft, cylinder head, increased compression, 45 millimetre side draft Webers, 280 horsepower. These cars were very, very fast. In fact, there's an interesting story behind these cars. Chrysler Australia actually sent someone over in an early pacer with the late model Hemi engine in it, the 265, to Weber in Italy to develop the carburation system on their car. Imagine the sound of one of these Hemis roaring through the hills of Italy. It would have been an experience you'd never forget. And they were very successful. The Achilles heel of these cars with the three-speed manual gearbox. They had a mountain of torque, don't get me wrong, to push those three ratios, but it did definitely let them down in a racing situation. They also suffered in the area of brakes as well. Either way, they were still fast and they really did make the V8 Brigade take a lot of notice. But things then did change with the E49. Now the E49 was the banger, 302 horsepower, 14.4 seconds over the quarter mile. It actually out accelerated the phase three GTHO over the quarter. Yes, it did run out of legs and the GTHO would run away from it upstairs, but that's still a hell of an effort for a six cylinder car. And guess what? They also had a four speed gearbox upgrade too. So it definitely helped them out on the racetrack. I know people can say would have, could have, should have, but these things almost won Bathurst. In fact, they were leading the race at one stage. 
They came in and the wheel nuts seized. They couldn't get those wheel nuts off. It held them up in the pits big time. They got back out in the racetrack and finished in the top three, but it was all over Red Rover. They just couldn't make up that time. Boy, would history have changed had they won that race. Well, that's what I call a barn find. I've never seen so many cars inside one shed my entire life. I absolutely enjoyed it to the hill. Problem is, though, it's starting to get dark now, and I can't see what I'm doing in there. I'm going to end up falling over and breaking my neck. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry I couldn't show you any more cars. I did my best within daylight hours. I'm really loving this barn find stuff. It's amazing what's locked up out there in sheds. I'm sure we're going to find plenty more of it, so stay tuned in the future. I look forward to bringing it to you. So does Mick Kirsten. See you later. Remember viewers, if you want to see past gasoline episodes, go to shannons.com.au. Click on the gasoline link and enjoy. And remember, this is a whole new season of gasoline with new episodes every Tuesday night at 8.30pm, Australia wide. Gasoline is proudly brought to you by Shannons, insurance for motoring enthusiasts and the following sponsors. I'm Michael Kurz, I'm producer creator of Gasoline. Hope you enjoy.